everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We are Gabi and Danielle, and we're here to talk about our experiences and our recommendations for students who have experienced health changes, challenges, and disabilities, all of the above, while they're in graduate school. So we are both currently grad students. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at MIT, and I study marine geology. And I'm a third year medical student at Tulane University down in New Orleans, um, and I hope to go into primary care and focus on geriatric patients. We actually met through Instagram, which I think is sort of a fun fact. Um, we had never met in person before last night at one o'clock in the morning. So um, it's really cool to be here presenting together, and um, hopefully you'll see that we're real friends even though we were only internet friends. So this is a little bit more about us and our background. Um, I personally uh, identify as queer and Mexican American and that has shaped all of my experiences in higher education as well as my now new identity as a disabled person. So I think that's important to sort of put out there and start. Um, and we also have the same connective tissue disorder which is part of why we're friends. So we both have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome which is a tissue disorder, like I said, that, is, that impacts all of the collagen that we have. It's the most common protein in the human body. That's what I read. You could tell me Sorry. if that's fake. Okay. Um, and so it, it affects every body system that we have. Yeah, so I'm a third year medical student. Um, I, I like to say I'm chronically chill to put a little more fun in the fact that I am chronically ill and now identifying as a disabled individual. Um, in addition to our connective tissue disorder that we share, I have a form of autonomic dysfunction. So your autonomic nervous system kind of runs the, I like to say automatic stuff in your body. Um, and mine just doesn't want to work. So I have issues with temperature regulation. If I stand for too long, I faint, um, all sorts of good stuff like that. I also have chronic daily migraine. This current migraine I have, um, we're celebrating our, our 15 month anniversary coming up. Um, so with the light sensitivity and all the things that come with migraine, it's been really interesting being a future provider and professional patient at the same time. We're gonna ask you to tell us a little bit about why you're here. So if you could get out your phone or laptop, um, we're gonna go to this website, www.menti. M-E-N-T-I dot com. Sorry, that caption is wrong at the bottom, so make sure you use the one that's on the actual um, presentation screen. And then you're going to put in the code 423094. And if this is not accessible to you, you can also send me an email, and I'll just put it into the system. Or just let us know, flag us down, and we will put it in. But the two questions that are going to come up are about who you are and then about what you're most interested in getting out of this short session. And while we're talking about what brought you here, we want to acknowledge that we're gathering on the traditional lands of four indigenous nations. And um, this is the statement that's provided by OSU. So if you want to learn more about that, I encourage you to look up OSU land acknowledgement. And there's a whole lot more information there. So I'm going to transition over to Hopefully your answers, yay, it's working. Again, the code is still up here, 423094. And so each dot is one person. So we have students who are in college, et cetera, an educator who are at all levels of education, administrators, parents or caregivers, patient advocate or self-advocate. That's kind of an insider term, so it sort of just means someone who works to advocate on behalf of all patients, on behalf of themselves. Um, sometimes disabled people can't have full-time jobs or don't have full-time jobs, but the reality is that just living our lives is a full-time job, so I like to include that as a role. Uh, researchers and other, so those are kind of the options we have up here. It looks like, from what has come up so far, most of us are students and educators with some admins and other people around there, patients, parents, which I appreciate. Thank you to, shout out to the families, right? Thank you. Um, I think that'll let you keep going so you can keep adding more, which is great for our data. We both love data, so please keep putting those in. And the next one we're gonna ask is, what are you most interested in learning about? And I believe the screen should let you slide them up and down so that you can rank them. These are just a few of the things that we know about. 
mostly. We could do marine geology and uh, family medicine, right? I guess. Yeah, it's working. So you can see them popping up here um, where the sort of top priority so far is kind of bubbling up to the top. This is great. I'm glad we did this because we weren't sure exactly what the audience would be. So if you were all disabled students and we wanted to just have a vent session, that would be very different from if you are all interested in resources and making schools more accessible. So this is great. Uh, we have 24 and the last one we had 26, so I'll give it another minute. But looks like the first priority is um, learning about making schools more accessible and resources for students with disabilities closely followed by balancing health and academic success. So that gives us a sense of who's in the room and what we're interested in learning about. Thank you for the data. If I can restart this. Okay, and you, again, that'll stay open for the rest of the talk, so you can still put that in, and um, you should be able to also ask us questions through there, or you can just ask us at any time. So I'll let Danielle take this one. But the problem statement here? <laughs> the problem is that, um, you know, we are high aspiration and high drive individuals. We're chasing down these big dreams in academia and medicine in a system that's just simply not built for us. Um, and we're able to do things and we want to do things, um, but the standard way of doing them is inaccessible or even impossible for the bodies that we're in. Um, so we've spent a lot of time kind of troubleshooting and making mistakes and learning from them and educating people around us to try to be successful. So I'll speak personally to my impact. Um, medis medicine's hard, medical school is hard, and when you're surrounded by medical people, um, if you bring up a single medical condition you have, you're immediately bombarded with questions. I had, um, I'm in my OB-GYN rotation, and I had a gynecologist insist that I didn't have any of my connective tissue disorder, insist that I didn't have my migraines, acting like an expert in a field that she was completely not educated in, because um, they're very separate fields. So it, it makes you isolated, it makes you feel alone. Um, there's a lot of sessions in school that I simply can't go to. Some of the optional things, I'm not feeling well enough. I spend most of my study time actually studying from home, either in bed on the couch, laying flat. So there are opportunities that I can't have. Um, and every day it feels like I have to rebuild the system for how I can exist in the medical education system. Yeah, if you even Google resources or sort of higher ed, chronic illness, any wide range of those things, you're not going to find a lot. Um, so I feel like before I found communities online and some in person now, um, people like Danielle, I felt like I had to come up with everything on my own. And that was really, really difficult. So having someone, um, even if it's through Instagram or Twitter or any other digital communication who can say, yeah, that's happened to me. Yeah, I get it. Uh, is super important, but that's very difficult to find. And the only way that we've been able to find that is by seeking it out ourselves. We're highly capable, we think, we try, <laughs> but we also are highly capable of doing research and figuring out stuff on our own, but it doesn't really seem to make the most sense to do it that way. So we're trying to come up with a few lists of resources here that hopefully all of you can use. And we just want to reiterate, we're not asking for graduate school to be easy. We're not saying that school should be uh, especially easy for people with disabilities or that accessibility would change the rigor that we are under, under undergoing, we are experiencing. Um, I think that's important to note, especially when we talk about mental health. A lot of the times people say, well, we can't, can't be too soft on you. This is just how it is. And I think that that's crap, personally. I think everyone should try to be more kind, but I do want to make it very clear that we are just saying that we think that students with disabilities, with health conditions, with mental health conditions, and we know that those don't always overlap, um, that we want those students to just be able to make it through. At the end of the day, if a student leaves a graduate program, that's a huge loss to the student, to the program, and to really all of the funders who have helped make that happen. So um, both 
for just like it is right that students with disabilities should be able to have access to an education but if you want an economic reason it's very expensive to have someone leave a program especially a phd that's been fully funded if i left now that's four years and i don't even have a master's degree from my program so it would be four years that the national science foundation has put into me that i would just be not having kind of returned the benefit of if that makes sense which I don't think is going to happen. I'm going to make it through. But the problem is when students leave, we don't have that kind of return on investment that I think that they're looking for. This one makes me really mad, so I'm going to start with Danielle here. <laughs> It is illegal per the law to discriminate against you because of your health. But take, for example, with my dysautonomia, I have to sit, I have to do a lot of modifications where I can't be on my feet for a long time. And in my upcoming surgery rotations, when I have to stand for 12 hour cases and not contaminate a sterile field by sitting down, what does that look like? So oftentimes people with chronic illness go to the disability office and all they help you with is testing accommodations. So they'll let me wear my sunglasses and they'll let me elevate my computer on a little stand so I'm not craning my neck. But other than that, what I'm facing on the wards, all the interactions I'm having with my educators and the doctors who are my teachers, uh, and the, the difficulty of working in a hospital in that capacity, there's no help for that whatsoever. Yeah, both of us, I think, have spent quite some time even getting diagnosed. Um, so I spent two full years just in the process of getting a diagnosis. I've had widespread chronic pain since 2015, um, and it took until late last year to get a diagnosis. So when I went to the accommodations office, they said, well, what's your diagnosis? And I was like, well, what's the next question? Can we try the next? <laughs> just what's the next thing you need to ask? And they said, what accommodations do you need? I was like, well, I don't know. That's why I'm here. Can you tell me what you can do to help me? I'm in pain. I'm struggling. I can't get the amount of work done that I want to get done. So what do you think I should do? And they sort of looked at me and were like, well, most people who need to sit down do computer work. They don't really work in the labs. And I was like, okay, MIT, world-renowned research institution. That's the best you can give me. And this guy was sort of like, you know, if you needed if you needed to use the elevator, we could get you ID card access for that. And I was like, this is the best you could do, really? But these are both phrases, what we have up here is, it's illegal to discriminate, and have you gone to the disability office? Those are two things that people say to us all the time when they find out that we're struggling with these issues. And I think that it reveals a level of misunderstanding of kind of what that experience looks like. So. I think that accommodations offices are great. I think every school should have an accommodations office or a student disability services coordinator. But that is only the very beginning. And I hope that we can go way beyond what is legally required for access. We wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges that come up specifically, sort of like Danielle has said, that you have to disclose your migraine disorder or they ask you way too many questions about it. Yeah, they'll, not only do I have to disclose exactly when I was diagnosed with what, what my symptoms were, but they want to know every single medication I'm on, the dosage, what I have, like what have I tried, what have I not tried. For just my migraines alone, I've tried at least 30 different medications. So sitting there when I'm trying to round on a patient and you know bringing the attention to me and talking about oh, can I pull up this chair because, oh, you need my medical chart, like just for me to do my job. Um, it's, it's frustrating, it takes away from the patient, and it also makes me feel unsafe in my learning environment because every step I take and every move I make, not to start quoting songs, um, <laughs> it just kind of came out, I, I have to defend every single choice I make because the reality is every decision I make from when I get up in the morning, how I like fold my pillows at night, what I eat, what glasses I'm wearing is dictated by my chronic pain and my illnesses. And not only do I have to make those accommodations for myself, but I have to fight to be able to do them without shame. So that's been very difficult. Yeah, I bet this is one of the first presentations you've seen where people are sitting down to do it. And it's the first one I've done where I'm sitting the whole time. But we were both saying up here, we're so much happier doing it this way. So why don't we always present in a chair? I can think more clearly. We can you know, see you all. We're all at the same eye level, so that's kind of nice. There are benefits to doing it this way, but this is not a 
legally required accommodation. Like I'd asked for a chair, but can I stand if I had to? Yeah, I guess so. But can I do my job effectively if I have to stand for 45 minutes? No. So um, we've put up the structure of collagen also here because I, even though I work in marine geology, people end up with a lot of questions. So I say, I have this connective tissue disorder and they say, how exactly does that work? You know, what does collagen even look like? How prevalent is that? How many people have this disorder that you have? And these are people who are just so curious and they're showing that they care because they're showing that they care by asking these questions. I recognize that and I appreciate it, but I'm not a biochemist. All I know is what I've done research on and what my doctors have told me, which is almost nothing. So in case you were curious, this is what collagen looks like. It's a trihelical structure and it's pretty stretchy. Ours is too stretchy. It's about all I got on collagen. <laughs> it's really, we've tried the collagen peptides, by the way, in case anyone's wondering. Doesn't, Doesn't do anything. What you ingest isn't gonna fix your genetic condition. You can't like ingest something to fix what your body is making. Um, like our, our genes make our collagen wrong, and so eating something isn't gonna fix it. So I'm not buying your expensive collagen peptides. We've been pretty, um, I guess, negative so far, but that's just the reality. So we did want to talk a little bit about what has been good and what we've gained out of our experiences so far. So for me, um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture of me climbing out of a cave in northern Mexico during my field work. And this happened... Uh, almost exactly a year ago. So I had rappelled down kind of like superhero style where you feed the rope through and you slide down and then you have to climb back up. And I had to climb up about 30 meters um, upwards. So it was a long way up and I just literally had no choice. And so I found kind of this happy place and I was like, well, if I want to get out of this freaking cave, then this is what I have to do. And my friend took this picture of me and I keep it on my computer desktop because when I'm having a really high pain day or I'm having a really just frustrating day with research, I remember one time I climbed out of a cave. No matter how bad I felt, I climbed out of that cave. So I am also great at squeezing into very tight spaces in caves. Uh, the cave guides have been like, you're very flexible. Like your leg really, I don't know how you got it to fit in there, but that's great. And I'm like, it's fantastic, really. <laughs> like you should see what else it can do. But uh, those are sort of my, my ways of trying to show that there's benefits and keeping it light because that's the only way we can do it. But Danielle has better things. <laughs> they're, just, they're different things. Um, so I like to call myself a professional patient and a future provider. I've worked in healthcare for a long time during college and my gap year. I worked as a home health aide in res um, nursing homes as resident care aides. So, um, you know, I've also spent most of this past year studying horizontal and I spent about half of January studying for my big first board licensure exam from a hospital bed. I, I see my peers at school who are healthy and able-bodied and the worst thing they've ever had is strep throat in the seventh grade, trying to interact with patients, get their pain rating on a pain scale, trying to empathize with them, trying to educate them when they're in a very dark and scary place and they just can't connect and can't relate. And it's, it's not good for education, but above all, it's not good for the patient because if, if your provider doesn't understand what you're going through or have the tools and experience with which to empathize, no one's benefiting from that situation. So I, I wouldn't wish my experience upon anyone because chronic pain is a very dark place and chronic illness is a very scary thing. But the fact that I've been laying in those hospital vet beds, terrified and, and unspeakable amounts of pain, I can relate to my patients in that way and I can actually hold their hand and tell them what they need to hear because I've been that person. So I wouldn't say I'm thankful, but I'm learning. It's a good way to put it. Um, these are some examples of how we get through the day. You might have noticed we both have backpacks with us when a more typical thing to have might be like a dainty purse. Um, but our stuff doesn't fit in a dainty purse. <laughs> um, so this is one picture of Danielle that is all the things you needed for one day, right? For, well, not even. The things you could fit in your hands because they didn't fit in your backpack yeah, for one day. Yeah, just for like eight hours of the The morning. Like so these are all things, I'll read out the list in case there's anyone who can't read it, but it says, 
We need hydration, electrolytes, caffeine, snacks, medications, which include pills, injections, and topicals, braces, kinesiotherapy tape, which is, you know, when um, the volleyball players uh, play and they have the tape all over themselves, it looks really cool. It helps to keep our joints in place because the ligaments do it, don't do it for us. Love that. Um, we have supports we wear, a TENS unit where it feels better to be getting shocked by an electrical um, current than to just have nothing, which is also fun. Um, ice packs, heating pads, naps, sunglasses, sitting down, wearing masks, and way more things. And again, a lot of these things would not be considered legally required accommodations. They are things that we pay for out of pocket, and these are things that we need on a daily basis just to be able to do our jobs. Yeah, so on this particular day and this particular rotation, I've been working with a, in the labor and delivery unit, and so we have women after like a vaginal birth or after a c-section we have all these little bags you can fill with ice and give to the patient to help ice things down because childbirth is pretty exciting if you haven't seen it and <laughs> i'm the girl filling up ice packs and taking them back and putting them on my head so patient facing i look like this you know my glasses are pink and that's really the only thing that looks different about me and that's the thing with invisible illness but the second i'm not patient facing, I'm in the resident room or I'm in one of the student rooms, sunglasses on, I turn all the lights off, I pull all the curtains, I have ice packs on my head and any other joint that's being particularly grouchy that day and none of that fits into what the disability office would say is an accommodation or even even know about or with my autonomic dysfunction I'm hypovolemic which means that I just don't have enough fluid in my body and so it makes me particularly fainty so, you know, drinking Gatorade or drinking Pedialyte isn't just a fun post-workout thing. It's so that I don't faint every time I stand up. And so taking breaks to drink seems so silly when you're asking a really mean attending, I need to go drink something. They think you're just trying to get out of whatever clinical duties you have that day when the reality is I'm going down on this patient. Like, I will actually collapse onto your sterile field if I don't go do this. We wanted to talk specifically as a case study because we're throwing a lot of symptoms at you and we know it's probably a little overwhelming. Um, it's overwhelming for us too. <laughs> but we wanted to talk specifically about um, cognitive dysfunction or it's also called brain fog. Um, there's a lot of different names for it. But this is when we have temporary changes in our ability to think clearly. Um, we experience this differently, but um, for me, I have a hard time reading when I'm in really bad shape. Um, I have a hard time grocery shopping. Um, I get really overwhelmed with all of the lights and sounds, so I have to have a paper list, and I can't look for more than two items at a time, because if I try to look for three, <laughs> I can't remember the first two. <laughs> Um, and so it becomes a, an even longer process. I haven't grocery shopped alone in two years um, because of this cognitive load. So even beyond the pain, that um, difficult amount of, um, it's even happening now, of trying to think clearly and speak eloquently when that's something that's so important as academics is very challenging. Um, and I think it's something that I'm, one of the things I'm most self-conscious about is that I would be presenting or talking to a potential postdoc advisor and that I would just sound so ineloquent, um, like I don't know what I'm talking about because I can't remember the name of the cave that I went to or what an acronym stands for. Um, and it's temporary, but it's very scary and very frustrating. I had an instance the other day where I was having word finding difficulties and I forgot the word uterus. So I said baby house. And <laughs> because it's right. Um, and, and thankfully I'm able to hide behind humor like that because that comes off as very funny as if I'm trying to make a joke. And I'm lucky in that regard where my next best guess at the word is often kind of humorous. Uh, but it is, it's scary and it's frustrating because we are intelligent and we are capable and sometimes our brains just fall out of our noses and we can't remember our words. Uh, something with my migraines is that I'll have transient episodes of aphasia where I just can't talk whatsoever or I'll choke over words, I'll get stuck on syllables, um, I won't even remember words, can't read, can't write. And 
it's hard when you're presenting to a resident or an attending. So what presenting is, is let's say I have a, a woman who's halfway through her pregnancy. She comes into the emergency room for some heavy bleeding and she's worried about preterm labor. So as a student, I'm the first person who sees her. I have to take her, her history of present illness. So figure out why she's here, when it started, what gets, makes it better, what makes it worse. I have to go through every pregnancy she's had, how big the baby was, what week it was delivered, male or female, any complications get her entire medical history, get all of her medications, her family medical history, and then like head to toe any other thing that's going wrong. And I have to remember all of that, every single thing that woman told me, basically her entire life story and a lot of medications that sound like alphabet soup, and go back and give it to my resident or attending in like a 30 second rapid fire presentation where you're giving them everything they need to know about the patient. And they want you to do it without paper. That's how you excel as a student. That's how you get the highest evaluations from the residents' attendings is you can remember all those things, someone's entire life story and medical history without having written a single thing down. Like if they're on 15 different medications for their blood pressure, I have to know every single med and the dosage. And if it's two times a day, three times a day. Um, and when I'm having episodes of aphasia, like I can't say my own name, let alone all those things. Um, so we have up next, we have some some ways on how we deal with that. This is an actual interaction we had on Instagram a couple of weeks ago where we were commiserating over the fact that sometimes we just can't read <laughs> and it's a bummer. So what I do the most is that even though it might look suboptimal in front of my team who's evaluating me, I'll write every single thing down because if they want a good presentation out of me and I do give excellent presentations, I have to write things down. Um, and the unfortunate thing is I often have to dis disclose the fact that I have a lot of chronic medical issues and that I do have episodes of transient aphasia. Um, it, it's not fun to have to run through your trauma and your medical history every time you have to tell someone something important, but that's just how I've been coping with it. So a lot of writing, um, relying on humor, like the baby house, um, making my team very aware of what's going on. So I, I like to be very loud with my classmates so that not only do they know what's going on, we can work better as a team together, but I'm helping create doctors who are more understanding of these conditions um, and understanding what is an invisible illness looks like. So those are that's how I try to deal with this. It's it's hard though. I do look kind of dumb sometimes, but thankfully it hasn't happened in like a huge emergency yet. Knock on wood. I personally have dealt with similar issues by making sure that my friends and especially my fiance know that it's okay with me if they finish my sentence. So if I can't find the word, I tell them please please say the word like it. Sometimes they're trying to be nice and they let me struggle and there are some people who might prefer that and I totally understand that too. Um, there's some research that says that you're supposed to provide the word, the person's supposed to repeat it, and then you say the whole sentence again, but it takes a long time when you can't think of baby house words and things like that. So um, my friends do complete my sentences and it's helpful because then I can just move on. Um, I also, like Danielle, put my feet up, try a different physical position for both of us. Um, the blood stays by our, our toes, our feet, and so it doesn't go enough to our brain. And that's a part of the reason why we don't, can't think straight. Your brain is literally not being, I don't know, volume. Thank you. The, the Full perf perf perfusion. perfusion. Yeah. I feel like I'm in Grey's Anatomy. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so th those are just a few of our ideas. We're not sure if any of you need that advice, but these are just a couple ideas that you might not think of um, and things that, again, are not really accommodations, but things that we need. Um, and brain fog is actually really common across a wide range of um, disabilities, health conditions. There's some health conditions that say that there's like a 90% prevalence of patients who have brain fog along with all the rest of their symptoms. It's present. Um, sometimes I've heard about people who are hard of hearing or deaf after doing a long day of lip reading or of watching kind of five things at once, um, having that cognitive overload and um, those types of things. So these are just a few ways to deal with it and hopefully make you all aware that that's something that does happen. Um, and we're not even going into the fact that there are people with 
more permanent cognitive dysfunction or learning disabilities who have these problems all of the time. And we're not trying to say that they don't belong in science either. Um, it's just been our experience that we very suddenly had to start dealing with this. We've never been taught strategies to deal with it before. And so we wanted to share a little bit about that also. Now we're interested in hearing from you. We're hoping that you will turn to a partner um, and talk a little bit about either from your own experience, what are the significant health challenges, significant challenges you've faced because of your disability, health, neurodiversity, or other experiences. And if that's not an experience you've had, you could talk about friends, family, um, or just listen. You know, if you're paired up with a person who does have those experiences, try to listen. And what would help you be more successful? And again, I know we have some administrators and educators in the room, so what strategies have you used to make your school and classroom more accessible for people with long-term illness or disabilities? We're gonna give you four minutes, and then you're gonna have to report back. <laughs> Thank you, go. Should we 
bring it back together. Go for it. All right, guys, I love how much conversation we're hearing. It makes me so happy. We're going to bring it back. I'm doing two modes of representation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we'd love to hear if anyone is comfortable sharing what either what they learned or their own experience, you know, giving us a brief little blurb of, of what you've been facing or if you don't want to share that, that's okay but how you can be successful and how you found help or your strategies <laughs> um i have pots as well so like sitting down in random places i used to feel like really um, unconscious about it um just like hey i'll just take a sit in the grocery store this is casual but like bringing a book or just like i don't know just being like oh look at this thing on the bottom shelf or like i mean i'm just kind of finding strategies to like like at work i told my team like oh if i'm just you know sitting down somewhere like oh, that's just that new i'm just you know, legit <laughs> but i guess like being up front with people that you interact with them all and, like, this is very helpful yeah i have that own thing where i'll sit in grocery stores i'll even like lay down in the hospital where i can find a clean floor and oh it, it, when i find a clean floor um, <laughs> close enough um thankfully i don't have any like immune system deficiencies um and you know either finding humor letting people know or finding some sort of distraction so you don't feel self-conscious definitely Sorry, just to summarize, in case you couldn't hear the person who shared, um, more seat sitting in places all the time, bringing a book so it looks like it's casual, and telling your team and friends. Is that a good summary? Okay. Who would like more benches and chairs in grocery stores? <laughs> exactly. So if anyone knows people in high places at Star Market, I'd love to talk. That's my grocery store. Anyone else want to share either s challenges or potential success strategies? Yeah, uh, in the back. Hi. Um, I just thought that was something kind of funny or something that's really helped me. Um, my wife uh, really loves like um, like the cosmetics and stuff like that. So I go to Sephora a lot. So I don't know if you guys have been to Sephora, but it's extremely overwhelming. The lights are blasting. The music is loud. It smells like perfume. So really triggering for me, particularly for my migraines. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be so conscious when I would wear my sunglasses inside, so I wouldn't think I was like some kind of able or something. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but now I've just like been able to like own it, especially when I'm in Sephora, so I just pretend like I'm on like the runway or a model. Or, like, <laughs> I'm definitely supposed to be in this you know, strange uh, uh, store, so mostly I've just been able to just like own sitting down on the bus even though I'm not going to stand up for an older person or being able to wear my sunglasses inside. Um, just kind of be more honest and chill with my, <laughs> exactly, with my, um, my accommodations and with my dress. That's awesome. Uh, again, to summarize, that was so much. It was, Sephora's terrible. <laughs> I mean, there are benefits, but Sephora is a difficult store to navigate. You got to own it, and it's challenging, especially as young people. Um, I definitely get dirty looks when someone older comes on to the bus and I stay sitting. Um, so I guess those assumptions can be really hard. Yeah. I think that's a big part of it is um, you can't see what the difficulty the person's having mm -hmm. is so many people assume the worst. You know, mm -hmm. that just seems to be the case. And when you try to explain it, if they don't have any empathy for it, they haven't had experience with it, they think that you're just moving this off to these staff things. I wanted to ask you, when you're in med school, do they have a class in empathy? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, so I. <laughs> a class in empathy. When my daughter told me that, I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? You know, because we, we both share the same sort of um, difficulty in how can we look at empathy? 
I, you know, the, I'm sure you've all met doctors who just don't have that inherent empathy and that I can't fix and that's frustrating. But I will say that, one, we do have education on how to relate to patients, how to be empathetic. We have a lot of trainings working with standardized patients and actual patients. Um, working on those communication skills, active listening, and just being a good person. We have an entire course called Foundations in Medicine where we spend our two preclinical years having a lot of lectures, and we also can take additional electives on that. Um, I, I also have a lot of faith in the upcoming generation of doctors. If you guys aren't aware, my generation's called Snowflakes, and we are very socially aware with social justice. Um, we, we take people's voices seriously. We get up in arms about things that historically people haven't talked about or fought about, and while it can come across as overly sensitive to certain people who don't understand, those people are becoming doctors, and those people are going to be taking care of us in the future. So I have a lot of faith in this generation of my cohort. Yes. Okay. So I'm an endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hate on doctors. <laughs> <laughs> so I deal with lots of like type A, um, type uh, one type. Mm -hmm. The patients or the kids who don't make any insulin start at a young age, and I treat a lot of those patients. And I have to say to them, I tell them all the time, you have to be your own advocate. Like the, I mean, diseases you have described, that's not a common disease. Like if <laughs> someone says, I have diabetes, all the doctors know. I mean, connective tissue disorders or migraines, those are not the things all the doctors know. OB, gynecologists, uh, ophthalmologists, they won't have any idea of what you have. So you have to be your own advocate. And I'm very happy you are doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm really impressed that you are raising the awareness. But to expect from strangers that they will be kind to you doesn't happen. Definitely. And we don't, oh, we we don't expect... Yeah. So Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to be a family med doc, and I know that, you know, you know a little bit about everything. You don't know everything about everything in, in medicine in general. And so, when I go to the doctor, especially a new one, who I don't expect to know about rarer conditions or weirder things like chronic migraine, I print out all the resources possible. I give them like bullet point summaries because as someone with a rare illness, you have to educate your doctors. Um, and, and, and some doctors don't want to hear it, but hopefully you find the ones that do. Um, and you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but it pays off in the end because you're getting better care, for sure. Other questions? We have like two a minute. So any other questions <laughs> you want to share uh, or comment? Here's our info if you want to reach out to either of us. Um, we are on our phones probably too much mm -hmm. <laughs> when we can read. Um, but we do have um, Instagrams and Twitters up here, and we're happy to take questions or comments. And um, we have a lot of people who say, can I tell my friend that you, know, you have this? My friend has the same thing. I think she'd love to talk to you. Yes, happy to talk. Um, so feel free to do that. And we have a list of resources in this direction, a couple of links to other things. So I'll leave this up also. But thank you so much for coming and for listening to our uh, rant, our musings. our musings on chronic illness in grad school. Thank you. You made it. Resources for everyone. <laughs> Should I just go like this? Uh, yeah, I think I saw them taking pictures. It's me. It's me. In a cave. In scrubs. Okay.